Hello and welcome to the Mindful Millionaire podcast and YouTube channel. My name is Lisa Peterson and today I am interviewing my new friend, Mark Silver. Mark has been a heart-centered business coach since 1999. He is an amazing teacher and, and I recently read his book. He'll talk a little bit about that. But what I want you to pay attention to is this beautiful blend of business and you know spiritual teachings. And Mark is a designated master teacher within his Sufi tradition. He's received his master's in divinity. And I'm super inspired by how he models this pathway of breaking out of the toxicity of business that we often run into as business owners and ensuring that everything we do is inspired by love. You know, where is the love? Where is it found here inside of this problem or inside of this solution? And I know you're going to enjoy learning from him. I'm so inspired by his work. Enjoy. Mark, thanks so much for being here. I'm so delighted. Thank you, Lisa, for having me here. So if my audience is new to you, I would love it if you could just tell us a little bit about your background because it's very unique and it's very aligned, but I want to have them hear it straight from you. Oh, well, well, where shall I start? It's, <laughs> you know, when any journey like this is going to be a little bit, I think I'm guessing most people are familiar with the non-linear path. Um, you know, I grew up an activist um, uh, in the DC hardcore punk scene. I'm a Gen Xer, so that was the 1980s and, um, and was really turned off to the world of business, but I grew up in small business, parents, grandparents, family, um, small, stores, you know, small store and, and like that. And, um, and yet, um, I began to realize as I kind of grew up in my life, I had a lot of friends who were self-employed because there's no job that's going to employ them to do the amazing thing that they're doing, organic gardeners and healers and practitioners of all sorts. And, um, and I had learned a lot more about business than I thought I had through activism, through growing up in business, through running a nonprofit magazine, and even through being a paramedic. I was a paramedic for a time in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there were just all these different skills that kind of came together in surprising ways. And I knew that I had to also help people emotionally. I said to my wife, Holly, I'm like, oh my God, people are struggling with all kinds of emotional stuff in business. And um, and it was through her, the two of us kind of um, got sucked into, as happens on the spiritual path, um, to studying with a with a Sufi sheikh, and uh, that became like a deep uh, well that I began to drink from back in two th the year two thousand, you know, twenty three years ago, and I took hand and became we became part of that Sufi order and. I began weaving together like really weird, <laughs> hard to talk about esoteric Sufi teachings with business practices um, to realize that every act of business can be an act of love. And what our clients started to see was like, yeah, it, it works, it works and it's nourishing and it's powerful. And, um, and it's just lovely. And, and it, and it brings healing to a, deeply needed area of life, which is how toxic the world of business is. I hadn't realized, I have read your new book and I didn't realize how similar the timing is in our lives because I went down a very similar journey um, in 1999 after my dad was unfortunately murdered. Um, oh. That began my journey of diving in and I went to Buddhism and for many, many years um, practiced Buddhism and different than your experiences, I was employed by a large corporation at the time. And what I had to do was kind of keep the two worlds separate. So I had this deep 
just completely flowing relationship with Buddhism and the teachings and the studies and the practices and the retreats. <laughs> and then I had this traditional hardcore hustle and bustle, you know, financial um, role in, in a big, in a big bank. And it was, it's interesting how that those sort of situations of when we find it and where we can channel it kind of dictate what happens next in our life. And so it's, it's fun to kind of see your life through that lens of you had the opportunity to take what you were learning and immediately, immediately apply it or find opportunities to apply it in the life of, of sm small business owners. Is that what was happening? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It was, I mean, you know, these things happen the way that they happen. I couldn't have really planned it <laughs> in any way. But yeah, I was really fortunate. I felt like um, I was already starting to work with small business owners. I, w I started <laughs> world's worst graphic designer because I had worked on a nonprofit magazine and I was trying to help people design this was still the 90s trifold brochures business cards things like that and um but in the process of that i was having to help people get clear on things like their pricing and what they wanted to say about their business their messaging and stuff like that and i realized that one i knew more about that than i thought i did and of course have learned a ton more in the intervening decades but yeah when when the when the spiritual teachings of Sufism, and I started to drink those in, um, it became really clear. I, I, would, I was shown in my heart the overlay between some of the esoteric teachings and some of the business practices. Some of the business practices are junk. <laughs> we don't want them at all because they're, they're not healthy, but there are healthy ones that can be put even more in alignment and can be, yeah, just full of care and full of love as well as being practical and grounded. And that's, it's something I loved about Sufism is that Sufism was really um, intended to be grounded, to be in service of this world. It wasn't about, um, you know, escaping or transcending. It was about um, embodying and being in service. And uh, it really spoke to my heart and my own particular way of being and in the world of business is just so deeply needed. And uh, yeah, and in fact, I was lucky enough because when I did my initial three year training with my Sufi teachers to become a Sufi healer before I got my teacher training and got my master's of divinity later, um, I was actually able to study with a specialty in business healing. And that was, that was, that was just an extraordinary learning process for me. Yeah, the when people find themselves in this place of like, I'm in business, and I'm awakening to a whole new level of my spiritual journey. What do you recommend that people do? Because some of us, myself included, may struggle with that intersection. It's like, okay, well, when I'm doing the spiritual things, it makes so much sense. But when I do the business things, I'm kind of falling into the old, into it's like you so said, this toxic, these toxic yeah. practices. And then you, and then you think about them afterwards and you're like, oh, did I really do that? I mean, what do you, what do you say to folks who are really struggling with like this, the real world and and it feels like it's toxic everywhere it's hard to separate yeah. from it right well the way i start my book out is exactly this message that i've had to repeat over and over and over again because we just need to hear it is that if you have issues with business you have a legitimate reason for that like i don't ever want anyone to just get over their issues with business business has been done horribly for centuries late stage capitalism predatory capitalism that we find ourselves in is not a healthy system it's a deeply unhealthy unjust system um, and yet we're in it and um and so that's kind of the first step is just normalizing our experience and not thinking that oh i can just think my way out of this or it's just personal because that's another thing that our culture wants to do is personalize it and say look this is you know you're just thinking about it wrong and if you just change your mindset you can you know get whatever you want and it's like oh my god can we 
can we have some collective care and compassion and love here? But after that initial healing process that continues, I mean, healing continues, of course, it's, it, my tradition teaches that healing is in the details. It's not like we're doing healing up here and then coming down and do, it's like healing is in the details. And so what I like to do is I like to help our clients look at the details. Well, let's look at the structure of a sales conversation. Let's look at the structure of a marketing message or a marketing strategy. Let's look at the systems in your business. You know, let's look at the developmental model of how a small business develops and grows into something sustainable. And at each step in each thing, is love available even here? Is there a structure that supports love even here, that, that expresses love even here? And what I've discovered over the years and years and the thousands of businesses that we've worked with is that there are, there are, there are structures at each step. There are, um, business practices. Commerce and trade is not unique to capitalism. Capitalism as it is now has only been around for a few centuries. Before that, commerce and trade, it looked different in different cultures um, throughout the millennia of human existence. But, you know, indirect bartering, if you want to call, call it that, has existed for a very long time. And, um, and there are ways to do, even in this structure of capitalism, there are ways to bring love in, to find love there and to start to express it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I think that the beauty of what you point out that I really felt the shift happening as I read your words was making it okay to really question the toxicity that's out there and it shows up in so many different ways and i think first and foremost as intuitive empathetic beings you can't just turn that off because you're in business right and we wouldn't want to but unfortunately mm -hmm. a lot of people i think end up feeling like they need to but you you talk about just all these different practices that often are out of alignment, especially to empathetic people. So sales, marketing, the words you use, the offers and the way you, you seduce people or manipulate people or feel like you've manipulated people. And, and the, the thing that I hear in what you've been doing is you've been learning how to look at a practice question the assumptions underneath it, and then come up with a new way that's in alignment with, with this spiritual way of being. I, I don't even know that that's the right way of saying it. And I also want to just mention, you use the Sufi teachings, but they would apply to anyone who's wanting to be more, um, more tuned into this intuitive voice. Would that be a good way to yes, describe we've, it? Yes. I mean, we've worked with people from all different paths and no path at all. You do want to have some sense of like, there's a reality larger than the physical. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if, someone doesn't, if someone doesn't have a spiritual orientation, I have people I can refer folks to that, you know, that are full of integrity and compassion, but don't come from a spiritual place because mm -hmm. there's there's plenty of room for that also um obviously because it exists so there ergo there's room for it but i i um but yeah i mean we've had we've had buddhist nuns and priests we've had rabbis i've had catholic nuns i've had you know i've had wiccans and i've I just you know zoroastrians i mean i i i you know all i can't even name all the different paths that have come through and found connection. It says um, in the Quran, which is the holy book that I work from, it says um, that the divine said, we have created you uh, in different peoples and communities so that you may know one another. And the diversity of humanity is actually a deep blessing and um, a deep divine blessing on us. And so this is, um, this is something that I really welcome and celebrate. And I love it, you know, when there's, mm -hmm. when people come from a lot of different, a lot of different perspectives. Um, yeah. 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 And the, 
and this questioning of assumptions. I mean, is that what is that what we're doing when well, we I th- work with you? Well, I think that that's definitely an aspect of it. So, for instance, a lot of people come um, to us. I'll use a, I'll use an example that I think lands for a lot of folks. Um, there's this teaching in in almost anywhere you go in marketing that says speak to the pain, um, and the way that it's often done in the mainstream and in, in the world is that the the pain points get pushed on in order to create a reactive, sometimes even traumatized response. And the person is in so much distress that in trying to decrease the stress in their somatic body in the trauma response, purchasing the offer is, is shown as the way through to kind of calm the trauma reaction. That's classic manipulation. And, um, and is and is terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It's unhealthy. It's manipulative. Um, it's terrible. And so what happens is that a lot of people come to us because they've had these legitimately terrible experiences, then don't want to talk about pain points. And they end up with really ineffective marketing because people are struggling. But there's a Sufi teaching that says um, that the divine says, I was a hidden treasure. And I yearned to be known. And so I created the creation in order to be known. And so the Sufis believe that the entire, like the reason we exist is to know one another, is to know the divine within each of us, to be known, to be witnessed, that we have this divine spark, this yearning to be, to be known by one another. We want to, we want to connect in that way. Part of who we are, part of what happens for us is we hit struggles. If you don't mention the struggle that somebody's in, then they don't feel seen. And what you're saying doesn't feel relevant to them. However, you can state it in such a way that you're coming from a place where you see them as a whole complete being. You see the struggle that they're in with empathy and compassion without any need, without any need for them to fix it. You know, like without any need for them, oh, you have to buy from me or you're doomed. Like that's a terrible energy. But I can, you know, we do this all the time. Like I can see like you have you have a small business and it feels overwhelming and it's kind of exhausting and you're starting from scratch. So many people are in that position. It's really okay. You're going to be fine. You know, there are certain things that you can learn. You don't have to learn them from us. There's plenty of places to learn these things. They're basic principles but just really normalizing the experience and helping people feel seen. And then they can take a breath. There's a little bit of healing that can happen in the marketing itself, in that witnessing that is brought. And then because they've been seen and because I'm not trying to activate the trauma response and taking specific steps to not activate it and to, you know, de-escalate that response, then, you know, if we're relevant, if we resonate, they're able to come closer. They're able to respond to what's being said um, and make their own choice as an adult sovereign human being. I think the thing that's needed that we help people is, is not just question the response, but to start to develop the ability to lean in when something is emotionally uncomfortable like, oh my God, I've been manipulated in sales through people mentioning pain points. Rather than do that and repeat it or turn away from it and refuse it, we say, okay, what's really here? I really want to connect with people. What's really here? And we encourage people to go deeper and to lean in and to look like it, the question that we ask repeatedly, is love available even here? is the divine present even here in this aspect of marketing? And when people find it, they go, oh, I can follow through with marketing and feel good without feeling like I'm manipulating anyone. Along the lines of what you're talking about, I had a big epiphany in the conversation around niching and why it's so important. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with that concept, but in the book, you are talking about this 
being seen, like you can't see someone if you're not actually knowing who they are. And people struggle in direct marketing in particular because you aren't direct (laughs) face-to-face with one person who you're like, oh, I see who you are. This is how I'm going to talk to you. This is how I'm going to share my wares with you. In, In what happens in direct marketing is you can get really confused quickly of like, who am I talking to? Trying to talk to too many people at one time. And what you say is that when you do that, you are not ultimately creating the safest environment for someone. And people these days are oriented, which makes complete sense to me, to be safe. And so if you aren't being kind and compassionate to the audience that you ultimately want to serve by telling them, I see you, this is what you look like, these are the struggles you're going through, then then you're missing a beautiful opportunity. And I just, I just am, you know, praising you and I'm sure all the years of developing to this place, but anything you want to add of like why this is so important? I'm so grateful that it landed with you this way. Um, because it's 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 so important that we see each other. It's so important that we feel seen and feel connected. Like if we're trying to weave a, a better world, this sense of truly witnessing one another is so important. So the way that I often talk to clients, I'm like, I'm saying, you know, niching is one of those things that's not, it's not absolutely necessary in that the way that someone feels witnessed when you're in person with someone is just the nameless presence. Like if you're just with someone and you look into each other's eyes and you're connected, people feel witnessed without me saying, are you a small business owner who's struggling? You know, it's like, (laughs) you don't have to, you don't have to do that when you're connected. However, that can be a pretty exhausting way to carry your business. If to, if you have to connect that deeply with so many people and only discover in the conversation afterwards whether what you do is even relevant to them. I'm not saying that those connections aren't worthwhile on their own. Of course they are. But if you're trying to also earn a living and you're actually trying to not only earn a living, but get the help to the people who need it, it's, it's not always so helpful to go up like, you know, do you need this help? Do you need this help? Do you need this help? And it's like it's it's it can be it can be wearing because there's only so many personal relationships that we can maintain in a quality way, right? They've done those studies like it tops out at 200 or something like that, and a healthy business is going to maintain more relationships than that. Um, uh, not all active clients, but just you know at all different levels of connection. And so another way that people feel witnessed is when their circumstances are truly understood. You know, um, if someone has chronic illness, for instance, you know, some of our clients, you know, are health practitioners and work with people with chronic illness is one niche. And when someone's been struggling with chronic illness, especially one that looks invisible, you know, they're, they're, they're not in a wheelchair, they're just, you know, they have chronic fatigue or they have, you know, they have something that isn't so visible and looks normal you know, normative or mainstream or, you know, whatever, most of the time, for someone to actually see them and see the struggle and kind of like, yeah, I get it. Like this chronic health stuff is really hard. And it's hard not only because it's exhausting and because you feel like crap sometimes, but because it's so unpredictable. You never know when you're going to have a good day. You never know when you're going to do something that sends you over the edge and suddenly you're down for two days or what, you know, it's like when someone says, wow, you really get it. There's just a, um, again, it's another level of healing. It's another level of safety. Like, oh, you really see me. And if you really see me, maybe what you're saying is relevant to me. Maybe I can trust you to care 
for me and to not harm me. It's not always true. There's been a lot of people who use that kind of language manipulatively, so that's not everything that's needed to create safety, but it's a start. It's the first step. It's the first, okay, I feel like I can show up here and start to kind of see if it's safe. You know, I can start to see if this is relevant. Um, and uh, that that need for safety, I find that that's really what marketing is about. It's not really about, about attraction. Marketing is not about attraction. It's about safety. And um, and when we can craft our marketing to not try to pull people in, but instead just express our natural care and love for people, which that's that's where the attraction comes from. It's it's the province of love but then use our marketing to communicate safety to the right people. It's suddenly much easier to create marketing because you're not pulling at people. You're tucking them in, so to speak. You're offering a, a, a different presence that I think uh, people can really tell. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I have been coaching businesses for several years. And I think that one of the things that I just want to create a bit of space for here is in the beginning, when you're starting out, you may not know who that person is, but you know, the work that you want to share with the world. And there's nothing wrong with putting it out there, you know, and trusting that those early adopters are going to find you because maybe you, you do have general marketing and maybe like one of my clients has an offering that helps several different people. But what we've also seen is that there's a lot of work. If we were to continue working with helping you know, three or four different types of people. And it's, it's all relationship oriented coaching, but it, the relationship they have with their child or the relationship that they have with their spouse. If we were to continue focusing on all of those, my sense is, is it's a lot more work in the marketing and we have to constantly come up with like new and exciting kind of pitches because we're missing something. This is kind of the realization that I was really coming to as I was reading your book is if we were to narrow down and focus on just one of those segments and really go deep into that experience, those folks will and, and then the other piece is, is then the content that you create that may or may not be marketing content, right? It's not launch content. It's, it's that information that you're sending out into the social you know, world and the things that you continue to repeat. Now that goes deep and you're creating this really um, almost like a salon experience where people can come and they're like, oh, she is always going to help me kind of sort through this. And then once they start to feel safe in that environment, then it's like, well, maybe a class would be helpful. So it's yes. so much easier to yes. create that, that um, the possibilities for someone to feel like, oh, this is what I need. Like they're selling themselves rather than you selling them on something. Yes. I think that that's entirely true what you're saying. And, you know, business life, almost anything is iterative, right? It's like, we don't, a brand new business owner should not have, unless they have like a download or like guidance or just clarity from other life experiences, they shouldn't have that kind of like crystal clarity on their niche. Like it takes, you know, multiple times, my colleague, um, Tad Har Hargrave calls it the niching spiral, you know, like you're spiraling in towards the center. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we still encourage people um, to pick something, even if it's not so crystal clear, even if it's not so zoomed in, uh, not with the intention of getting married to that particular niche, but to making it clear enough so that they can start to implement and get traction. And then if they want to change the niche later, because they've gone through the other developmental steps with the clarity of focusing on somebody, um, on an audience, then it's easier to go back and go, okay, I'm going to tweak it for this. I'm going to tweak it for that, or I'm going to, you know, redo it for a different audience. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the niching question I think is 
one of the things that is so um, scary, burdensome, mm -hmm. you know, people resist it. And let me just share a couple of thoughts about it that hopefully will ease people's hearts, even minds around it. Um, I'll start out just by saying that everyone who we've ever helped to help to niche, the thing that, that they always say to us, and we're talking about so very many people, as they say, the one thing I wish is that I hadn't resisted niching for so long, because once they settled into it, everything else got easier. Not necessarily easy. There's still challenges in life, right? Um, but everything else became easier. And they and the things that they were scared about, about not having enough clients or being too bored because it was too small a focus or whatever, none of those manifested. So I want to say that a niche, first of all, is not about smallness or narrowness. It's about clarity. It's not about how narrow can you get. It's just about can you be speaking to someone and they can say, oh, that's me. You know, uh, I can, you know, I can say, you know, we help small business owners who want to make a real difference in the world and they need to make a profit. That's not a small niche, but it's fairly clear. You know, it can get more clear, you know, deeper into the marketing message, but it's, it's just, it's just naming that piece, you know, um, someone who says, you know, I help people who have been really active in life, but they've had some kind of injury and it's taking a long time and they just want to get back to their active life again. That's not so tiny, you know, but it's clear and somebody can say, oh, that's me or I know somebody who should talk to you. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing that I want to mention, there's this myth out there that there is somehow a magic phrase or an elevator pitch or 30 second or whatever it is that will move someone from being a stranger to pulling out their payment and becoming a client really quickly. And that is false. It's just false. There's no phrase out there that can do that. And when people carry the weight of believing that there is, it just makes the whole niching question or the whole, you know, what we call the one compelling sentence, that initial marketing message, what you, how do, how you answer what you do. So what do you do? It just puts such a unnecessary burden on it. What the, the most over underestimated dynamic in business, I think, is how long it takes someone to come to a um, significant purchasing decision. Uh, when a business doesn't have developed marketing systems and messages, the only clients they have are the people who, like you said, the early adopters, the people go, oh yeah, I want to jump in. I just get your energy and I want to do it. And so newer business owners believe, oh, that's how it always works. But the truth is that a business in momentum, the of all their clients, the clients who are like that, who jump in immediately is actually a very tiny percentage. And, um, and it ha it functions even when you're doing very spiritual work. I was uh, one more story. I know I'm going on about Love this, it. but it's, it's good. <laughs> it's, uh, there's a so I was I became faculty in my in the Sufi school, and we I was teaching in the teacher internship program, and you know these are people who had been trained as Sufi Sufi healers, and then they were being trained as Sufi teachers, and they were going to go out and like teach and have healing healer practices and and everything and. And um, I was co-teaching with one of the senior faculty, and I said, um, uh, and I was explaining this teaching then. And even my co-faculty, kind of everybody argued with me, saying, I can kind of get how that works, you know, but this is a spiritual school, and people just jumped in. They were just moved in their heart, and they made the decision in the moment. I said, all right, do you mind if I ask some questions? And I went around the room, and I started asking people, and every single person there, yes, they had made the decision in a moment, but every one of them had had preparatory experiences, sometimes with other spiritual paths, sometimes with other situations, anywhere from six months to 10 years. None of them were just kind of wandering around doing absolutely nothing to do with any kind of spiritual seeking or healer seeking, and then came across you know, our brand of Sufism and made the decision in a moment, like nobody. And they, it really sank in that even 
for very spiritual decisions, we need to prepare. Like we need to, we need to give spaciousness to people to make decisions of integrity. If you try to force people to make decisions too quickly, they either run away or they come in and then they're regretful and upset because it wasn't really coming from a place of sovereignty in their heart. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. So many things coming up as you describe that. Some One thing that I've noticed is uh, being able to sometimes explain what we do as spiritual beings running a business, like just being honest that that's never been the easiest thing for me. And, and I can't look to others to do it for me. <laughs> and so it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And sometimes I can get lost inside of that and lose my motivation around it because it is so difficult. And one of the ways that I've overcome that is what is easy for me is teaching and answering questions. And you know, something so effortless as to last week, I held and ask me anything. And I, and I gave parameters of like, what am I talking about, but oriented towards finance. And it was a lovely 90 minutes together. We had a huge turnout, um, mm. hadn't done that kind of thing before. And several of my clients or past clients reached out and they were like, wait a minute, that was brilliant. All these new people got to know who you are. You just did what was natural to you. Like, I'm going to copy that. And I was like, please do. You know, I was just doing it because I wanted to connect with people because I've been sort of disconnected for several months. And I was like, hey, who's out there? Who wants to, you know, receive some assistance? Because it is a trying time right now financially for a lot of people. But I learned inside of that, that there are just, I continue to learn that there are so many different ways in which we can go about marketing and sometimes just trusting that the things that we are really, really good at will show themselves and we don't have to overthink them. We don't have to spend, you know, hours and I've spent months working on launches that might not have been success as successful as something that I did last week that I probably could have put an offer connected to it. You know, like <laughs> you just have to <laughs> laugh about some of these things. It's so true. It's so true. And it's also really hard to discern how they feed one another, right? It's, I think that, um, I think what you're saying is absolutely true. And if we only look for the things that are super easy, like sometimes we're being asked to do difficult things, you know, I mean, <laughs> yes. do you know, it's like, of course. I mean, that's, that's how we, that's how we strengthen ourselves, right? It's like, we do gardening here and we're, you know, we have a little bit of property here and we're trying to plant a food forest. And I'll tell you, you know, digging holes for trees or doing gardening or permit. I mean, it's, it's hard work. It's sweaty, hard work. And it's, and the fruit doesn't come for a while. You know, this year we finally got the first peaches off our trees. It was very exciting. But it's um, the, I, I, it's very important that we really, like whatever way we've been going, like the, the Sufi path talks about the, taking the middle path. So that if someone is very attached to doing things the hard way, yes do some really easy stuff and let it open. <laughs> and then there are people who are like, for whatever reason, maybe they've been misled or maybe they've learned or whatever it is. And they're always trying to find the easiest, easiest, easiest. And maybe there just needs to be some, some, you know, some, some sweat Structure equity in. that needs to be put in. <laughs> and so I always try to look at in myself and in, with my clients, like which way have you been doing it? And would we be, served by bringing it to the other side of whatever mm -hmm. polarity we're working with. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can be deeply beautiful. And I, I think this actually feeds into something that I, that I wanted to say, because you, you'd said, you know, when we're spiritual beings running a business, one of the things that I've learned in Sufism that I'm so deeply appreciative for, because I'm, I'm really a very practical person. I like having my hands in the ground. I like, you know, I was a paramedic, a first responder. I was a volunteer firefighter. I like doing things in the world. I'm not, you know, um, 
uh, naturally in the ethers. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a six planet Virgo. It's a little bit intense over here, but anyway, <laughs> so, um, but one of the things that I've learned in Sufism is that we can't elevate or privilege the, the so-called spiritual over the physical. Everything is from the divine. Everything is from the divine. You know, a structure can be just as holy and sacred and beautiful and powerful a system as an internal experience of connection and deep intimacy with the oneness. This is, it's all part of the love. It's all an expression of the love. And if we think that somehow the internal experiences are better, that's going to undermine our ability to be of service in this physical, beautiful world we're in that we're mistreating so terribly. And it's going to undermine our ability to face the reality of our business and see the beauty that can be in our business if we're always trying to transcend it or we're always trying to treat it as spiritual. Um, and I just really encourage, it's like sometimes it, this, ha this happens quite frequently. People come to me, come to us and say, you know, I have a problem with receiving. That's why my business isn't working. I'm trying to work on the spiritual issue with receiving. I'm like, okay, that may be true. But, you know, let's take a look at your business. And we turn out that they don't have clear messaging and they don't understand how a sales conversation can be structured with integrity and they don't have clear offers. And, you know, like there, there's these very practical pieces that aren't that are that are veiling their heart. It's veiling the gifts that they have because the clarity's not there. We start putting those things in place with heart, with love, with spirituality and integrity, but practical pieces. And then they realize like, sure, we all have issues with receiving, but the spiritual issue wasn't nearly as big as they thought, you know, because you don't have to be enlightened spiritually to make your business work. That would be really unfair. <laughs> 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 and really evidently untrue when we look around the world you know it's like I want people with spiritual hearts to not feel like they have to climb a spiritual mountain before they can start making a living and helping people it's just not necessary I love that the in reading the book something that was also really cool. I've never seen anyone talk about it. And I just kind of want to plant the seeds so people know that it's like, ooh, maybe I need to go run and get this book. Is <laughs> You talked about being really honest with ourselves about what size of business we want to create. And I think that in reading what you've written, it was very helpful for me to notice part of, I think, the reason that I decided to shut down a lot of our group programs and the infrastructure that had been created for the business was at this time in my life, freedom is a high value. And the business, when you have a team of people and you have a hundred plus clients, that wasn't fitting with who I've become at this moment in time. Could it change in the future? Yes, but the dedication and the skills and the um, time involved of running the business I had created did not coincide with who I think I'm ready to be. Also, I think it helped me reflect that um, sometimes we can actually make a bigger difference in the world by being more freed up in our time probably always, but many of us get really wrapped up in the business. It's, it's exciting. It's interesting. It's never boring. Um, <laughs> you know, I can definitely be a workaholic, you know, I'm totally guilty of that, but, but being able to just know thyself and then really take an honest reflection of what's going to be involved to build that business that you may be thinking about. And you have a step-by-step -step protocol of looking at like, these are the phases. The other big thing that you talk about that very few do is the patience that's involved in, in, in the time that it might take to get to the next stage, you know, should you decide to even go beyond what you've built? But am I capturing this? You are. There's, you know, there's a, um, over 4,000 businesses over 23 years, actually it was a few years ago, so the numbers weren't where they are now, but um, 
I started to observe this developmental model, you know, that, I mean, like everything that grows goes through stages of development. Of course, it makes sense that there's stages of development. And I've observed this over and over again. And so there's, I've identified four stages of development that are particular to these micro-sized businesses, people that are either solo or just have a very tiny team, kind of like Heart of Business has. And, um, and most people think that they need to get all the way to stage four, which is what you're referring to when you actually have a company and you have a, a whole team. And most people are happier at stage three, which is when, yes, you do have some help. Maybe you have VA or admin support or, you know, you, know, you have some people around you that are, you know, web designer, accountant, bookkeeper, you know, some basic things that keep you from being burdened, but not an entire team. And when you do want to go to stage four, you just have to really, I, whenever somebody comes to me asking, I always push back very hard and make sure they're really up for it and that they want to do it for reasons that are really clear in their heart and not just because they think they have to go there because usually the things that you want like being able to take vacation have retirement and um have good income and really work with the people you want to work with are really available at a stage three business which is what i call momentum and um and i think that we also get lured in i think this you know you mentioned making a big impact I think, you know, one of the things that capitalism does is it, um, and colonial, you know, colonialism and white supremacy and sexism and all of these isms like that are based in supremacy notions have kind of deeply imprinted us with this myth, this lie that we have to make this huge world changing business and world changing impact all on our own. It's so interesting because I've been learning a lot about permaculture and regenerative agriculture and forest, you know, for, you know, food forests and things like that. And I've learned, you know, relatively recently that when you look out in a meadow, a meadow is a very competitive environment where everything is like kind of vying to survive on like very limited resources. But a forest is actually a collaborative environment where Things are feeding each other um, in surprising ways. And that no one part of the forest is dominant. No one, no one plant or one tree. It's like it's how we all come together. And if we can come into a healthy sense of humility in our own hearts and let go of this story that we've been fed, that somehow we have to make this huge impact on our own, but instead we can willingly and happily contribute to what we're all wanting, a more beautiful world with more justice and more love and more care for all of us where our needs are being cared for, then we don't have to take up that colonialist white man's burden that was such a terrible part of, <laughs> that is such a terrible part of this traumatizing and traumatic economy that we were raised with and instead have a hope of bringing healing and, and starting to really turn the tide, which so many people are. If I pretended that I was the only person who had written a book about healing in business that was trying to like make it like that would be so absurd. I mean, you're doing amazing work. I can name several dozen people that are doing amazing work. And thank goodness, because it's all so needed. Mm, so well said. And I think what I also hear is that it's funny because even in the interpretation of like big impact, I just want to say like one person's other than our own life, like one person's life being touched as a result of things that we've written or taught or conversed mm. about to me is a big impact. So yes. I do want to make sure that that's clear. <laughs> Amen. That's... <laughs> yes. Redefining the word big. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, or seeing it in that framework. Thank you for saying that. And I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. I just, it's such a common trope in the business development world. I know that you don't, I mean, we, you were just saying that you 
made your business smaller so that you could, so I, but it's just such a common trope and people get caught there so easily. Um, I wanted to speak to it, but I'm really glad that you affirmed that, that mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. So what's next? Where can folks learn more about you? Where can they pick up a copy of the heart centered business, which I am a huge fan of now. I will return to again and again and again. <laughs> I cannot um, speak higher on, on this book and the power of helping people. Thank you. Well, um, so the book has its own website, heartcenteredbusinessbook.com. You can download an excerpt there or find out where to order it. Um, and, uh, and then our business, heart of business, heartofbusiness.com is where um, our business lives. And, um, but yeah, the, I, um, it's a, it's, if this is resonated, I'd be honored if people want to check out the excerpt first and make sure that it really resonates with them, you know, or if you just want to jump in and buy the book, of course, I mean, we all know how this game is played, like really popular things are made more popular. So, you know, if you order a book, it adds to the numbers and then it, it helps make it more visible. And so any book by anybody, including me, thank you, um, that's doing heart-centered work in the world, if we can help, you know, when we have the, the finances to support making it more visible, I, I just think that's a wonderful thing that we can do for each other. 100%. I love always thinking about the fact that when a book is well written, as yours is, we as the reader have the opportunity to tap into countless years of experience for a very, very small cost. Like there's just <laughs> nothing on the planet to me. I mean, unless, I don't know, I guess some people can spend hours and hours on YouTube and try and find their way through learning things. That's not my jam. I like to read books. I think my listeners like to read books and this would be a very, very, um, powerful and rewarding investment of time and money. I promise everyone. So thank you, Mark, for being here. Thank you, Lisa. I so I'm just grateful you're in the world doing what you're doing. It's a blessing. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you'll get all the latest updates of meditations, tapping videos, uh, different coaching calls that I share on the YouTube channel. And also be sure to take my money and chakra quiz. This shows you where you might be out of balance as it pertains to money and exactly what you can do for your next steps.